Hey everyone, Sam here. Good to see everybody. It's been a while since I uh, did a YouTube. Whoop. Let me just fix one thing here. There we go. All right. Yeah, it's been a while since I uh, did a YouTube session, but uh, let's dive into this very important topic here trading risk. And uh, some of what we'll talk about is what, you know, risk that most people don't talk about and don't think about and everyone should. So let's dive in. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the chat. I will get to them as soon as I can. And uh, here we go. Keep in mind that we are not investment advisors and there is certainly no uh, guarantee of success in trading. That's kind of our theme here today, right? Um, when you get involved in this, you need to understand the risk. Uh, you need to understand risk. You need to be okay with risk and certainly, you know, understand what you're doing. People love to just jump in and start trading and it typically doesn't end well. Now I highlighted uh, a sentence here. Available research data suggests that most traders are not profitable. Another way to say that, most people lose money. And it's very important, you know, I, I can't think of a more important topic, right? We could talk all day about making money and we'll talk about supply and demand and, and all that, but this is a very big deal. So let's dive into this topic and explore the reasons why people lose money. And feel free to share in the chat. We're all here together and everyone's uh, thoughts and opinions on this are welcome, right? But again, uh, available research suggests that most traders lose money. So we need to, we need to dive, we need to understand that, right? Um, this is certainly not something that most people should be doing, uh, but a lot of people do it. And uh, let's, let's dive into this topic, okay? So again, there is no guarantee of success. Make sure you know, what's pushing anyone to open an account and start trading. So take your time, make sure you have the discipline, make sure you understand how to do this and make sure you understand the risk involved and all that. Okay. And, and, uh, here we go. So we are going to talk about risk and not understanding risk and how to deal with risk. We won't dive into too many of the details of the numbers, but um, for those that want, uh, well, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Emotions, right? Emotions typically give way to risk disguised as opportunity, right? Um, we'll see an example of that in just a few minutes, but uh, this is something that gets a lot of people. And then there are many faulty trading and investing strategies out there. So we're going to dive into that topic as well. All right. And um, we'll see if anybody even wants to trade anymore after our time here today. But if I figure if, if we can cover most, if not all of the reasons people lose money and, um, and how difficult this is for people, you know, if you understand all that and still want to risk your hard earned money at the end of the session here, then, um, then I guess, uh, you know, well, let's dive in and, and, and figure it all out. Okay. But we're all here together. We're all, um, everyone wants to do well. Everyone wants to make money and, and grow. So again, um, anything you want to share in the chat, questions, comments, feel free as we get into the topics. So I've kind of, I've gone over this once before in the past. But we asked Google one time, what percentage of traders lose money? Google says 90%. Now, I don't know exactly what the number is, but if it's anything close to that, that's too high, right? So the next logical question is, if, the, if so many people are losing money, what are these people doing? What decisions are they making? More importantly, what is the strategy that's leading to those decisions? What does what trading and investing decisions, what buy and sell decisions are leading to this 90% of people losing money? So we asked Google, what are the most popular trading strategies out there? 
And you can see Google comes back with some, some answers here. And um, we're going to dive into some of this in just a little bit. Uh, we'll, um, a second half of our little session here today, we'll, we'll dive into that specifically. We'll look at strategies out there, um, what makes sense, what doesn't, and why. Most importantly, why. Uh, as you may know, I started my career on the trading floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange many years ago. That's where I developed the original supply demand strategy, um, the real supply demand strategy. I know there's a lot of versions out there today, but um, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit as well. But really the question is, are you thinking and executing like a novice trader and investor, or are you thinking and executing like a professional, right? So I want to share, let's start here. Let's start with understanding how markets work, emotions, risk, all that. I tried to pick an example here that I, I think most people like guacamole and avocados. Um, could have could have picked ice cream or something else. But um, let's take a look and dive into this topic. So, and we could, you know, we're talking about the trading markets, the financial markets and risk and all that. Uh, but we could really be talking about the market for anything out there. We'd still be having the same conversation. Right. So uh, the price of an avocado. Right. Um, just like the price of anything out there, prices change. So maybe typically the price of a really good avocado is $4. Um, I may be off there a little bit, um, but let's assume that the majority of time, a really good avocado is $4, All right? So if there is this big abundance of avocados and price drops to $2, what are you going to do if you like avocados? Are you going to buy the same amount that you would buy at $4? Might you buy more? Are you are you going to maybe not buy avocados because price has dropped from $4 to $2? Right? I don't think anybody would do that. Right? People that like, for example, avocados, when they go to the store and they see they're cheaper than they usually are, people get excited about that, right? And they typically want to buy more. Make sense? And I know we all know that, but you'll see my point in a minute. Uh, but what happens if there's maybe a shortage of avocados and the price goes up to $6 an avocado? What are you going to do? Right Now, I'm sure there's some people that just have to have avocados all the time, and they'll still buy an avocado or two at $6. But the majority of people will probably say, you know what? We're not going to do guacamole this weekend. Maybe we'll do the hummus or something else, right? Some other kind of, maybe something else. And uh, certainly the majority of people that eat avocados are going to buy more at $2 and they're going to buy less at $6. That's supply, demand, and fair value at work, right? Those governing dynamics of supply and demand Competition to buy at demand pushes price higher. Competition to sell at supply pushes price pushes price lower. Four dollars is fair value. That's where the majority agree to buy and sell. Right? Would anybody be excited to buy avocados at six dollars, or would anybody be be uncomfortable buying avocados at two dollars? Probably not. Right. Now, now I know this all sounds simple and there's nothing I'm telling you now that you don't already know, but when we go to the financial markets and the trading markets and we replace avocados with a Forex market with euros or the S and P or crypto or bonds or a stock, all of a sudden we, most people literally have the opposite mentality. They don't want to buy at $2 and they're excited to buy at six. It doesn't make any sense. This is one of the main reasons people lose money. Let's take a look, right? 
So I want to share, um, we're going to look at some examples here. Just so you know what you're looking at, this screenshot on the left is from our live trading and analysis sessions. Um, this is earlier this week. I was delivering a session uh, for our members. And um, we were looking at Apple. Apple had a demand zone down around 155. Um, this is early in the week, I think Monday, I believe. And um, and then sure enough, prices came down uh, right to our qualified demand zone. And as of today, have rallied back up to close to supply. They may even be up there at this point. I don't know where Apple is at the moment. Right? But think about it. Now let's talk. Um, let's bring the avocados back into it. Or let me ask you a question. How many people would be comfortable buying Apple or any stock down here at the lows? It's falling, falling, falling. Then it gaps. And then it trades lower. And remember, at one point, this was a big red candle. Anybody be a little uncomfortable would anybody be a little uncomfortable buying Apple down here, pushing the buy button? Right. Remember, this is earlier in the week, one of the one of the biggest drops in stock market history this week. Right. It, the market's bounced a little bit now, um, but on that drop, you know, the major stock markets were down uh, down huge. Right. Maybe be a little uncomfortable pushing the buy button there. Yes, most people will not push the buy button there. They don't want to buy because the news is bad, right? There's a big downtrend underway. Price is falling. It's just big red candle, right? After red candle. And um, if you do buy there, what, what do people accuse you of? What, what might people say? What might people say? Yeah, the S&P did bounce from a larger time frame demand zone there. I'm just looking back in the chat here. What are people going to say? If you, if you, down here, right at right there, if you say, hey, you know what? I'm going to buy Apple right now. What are your trading buddies and friends and family? What might they say if you're telling them you're going to do that? Um, MNM Forex, I see your question there. Um, we have a specific workspace for day trading, specific one for swing trading, and a specific one for longer-term investing, but we apply one rule-based supply-demand strategy to all of those, the same thing. Yes, exactly. They'll say, wait a second, you're catching a falling knife, or are you crazy? Have you seen Apple is collapsing? It just fell, you know, $5, almost $10 in the last, the last day. Right. Yeah. Catching a falling knife, all that stuff. Okay. Right. Exactly. They, however, if you told that same person who loves avocados, Hey, guess what? Avocados aren't $4 this week. I was just at the store and they're, uh, they're on sale for $2 and, but there weren't a lot left. Right. Anybody you tell that to, they're going to go to the store and try to buy as many as they can. See the difference now. The reason why people are scared to buy here is because, let's be real, what the question they're asking themselves is, is price going to turn? Is price going to stop falling and turn higher? Right Now, we put our, our demand zone was here for a very specific reason. We follow our structure and location strategy rules. Now, we don't have time to get into that today. I'm delivering a workshop tomorrow where I will dive into that. I can give you more information on that later. However, let's focus on risk. Okay. Um, now, even though this demand zone qualified according to our rules, and even though we look now earlier in the week, Apple you know, turned and rallied, um, did I know for sure? that that was going to happen. I mean, I was delivering this session with over a hundred members in it, you know, giving them this demand zone. Did I know for sure that this was going to, that Apple was going to turn here? No. Okay. Nobody knows. And anybody that tells you they do, they're lying to you, right? We don't know for sure. And that's what's, that's a big thing that you, you have to realize 
be very real and truthful with yourself and say, you know what? At the end of the day, this is all a guess. Okay. It's a, it's a, we want to make it the most educated guess we can. That's why we focus on just pure supply and demand, right? Follow our strategy rules, make everything rule-based. We use the supply demand strategy to hopefully um, put the odds and probability in our favor. And then we use, you know, risk management, risk reward uh, for the numbers. But at the end of the day, we don't know for sure that it's going to turn here. We, we expect it to and think it should, but it might not. So because of that, we know that if price does go through the zone, right, we have an order there to get out for a very small loss, a loss that we're okay with, that's manageable. Make sense? But even with that, right, and I know most of you here, if not all of you, are traders, and I know all of you, you know, you know what a stop loss is. And, 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 but my point is even having a stop loss in here, people are still so scared to push the buy button. Instead, they wait for prices to turn higher and then they try to get in, right? So I want to suggest something that may help you get over that fear. Assuming you're entering the market at the, around the right spot, assuming you have your stop loss in, and you're not risking more money than you're willing to lose, and assuming you have your profit target in, I want to share share a thought with you that may help you get over that fear. Okay. And one thing you so what you can ask yourself when price is coming down to your your demand zone, for example, and you're and you're still scared to push the buy button because you're asking yourself, ooh, what if it doesn't turn here? Is it going to turn here? You already know the answer to that question. You don't know. And you're never going to know. And if you're waiting for certainty, it doesn't exist. So just, you know, my point is like, get over that and, and, and let's get rid of that. Okay. Let's deal with what's real. So the question you can ask yourself, if you're afraid to push the buy button down here, which most people are, is this, what is the worst case scenario? If this trade doesn't work out and it goes lower, What's the worst case scenario? And if you're okay with the answer, push the button and buy, right? Execute your entry stop profit target. If you're not okay with the answer, that probably means you're taking on too much risk and you should not push the buy button. Does that make sense? Okay. And this is not, what we're talking about here is not, um, this is not just specific to trading. Think about any time you you risk money out there, you 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 put money out there uh, for something, hoping for a better return. Okay, maybe you're right. The the uh, the Super Bowl is in a couple weeks here in the United States, right? Big Super Bowl. Um, ad time, commercial time costs a lot of money. I don't know exactly what it costs, but it's like a million dollars for a a thirty second commercial or something. Sometimes, right? All of the companies that are paying that whatever it costs for that um, commercial time during the Super Bowl, they're putting a lot of money out there. Do they know what they're going to get back? Do they know exactly what the return is going to be? No, it's a guess. It's a calculated guess. It's an educated guess. But at the end of the day, there's no certainty. My guess is some of those companies get back, you know, in revenue many times what they spend on the commercial but I bet there's plenty of companies that, that don't at all. They would have been much better off not putting that money out there. They lose on that trade. Does that make sense? So this is not just specific to trading. And the more I think you can, you can look at this and think about this, you know, similar to how we buy and sell other things in life, similar to how we take on risk in other parts of our life, right? This is not any different. This tends to just happen faster because markets are moving and, and all that. All right. Make sense? Okay. The other the other way to look at this is, you know, yes, this is these are shares of Apple, but why can't it why can't this be a chart of the avocados or your favorite ice cream? We'd be having the same conversation, right? Okay. Uh 
good question in the chat. Why wouldn't this 175 be supply? So when it comes to structure and location, structure-wise, this would not qualify. Location-wise, it's right in the middle of this range. So those two reasons, this would not qualify. Okay. And by the way, you're going to hear me talk about location, maybe a little bit structure throughout our session here. Um, this session is not meant to go dive deep into that. Um, if you want more information on that, I'm, I'm doing another free, uh, it doesn't cost you anything tomorrow. So I'll give you more information on that later. Ask all the questions you want. My point is, if you want more information on that, there's another uh, session that's not doesn't cost you anything to come to. I'll, I'll give you more information on that later. Um, I just don't want you ever, I don't want anyone to feel like we're, you know, not going over things we need to go over. Great point in the chat. Life is all about risk management. So much of it is. I agree. Now, um, when people hear good news on, on a stock, right, what do they tend to do? When good news comes out on a stock, what do they tend to do? They tend to buy, right? That's what most people do. Well, does anybody know why Apple's gapping up, gapping up today? This, this is today. It's because they just announced good earnings right? So there's a gap up. But your average person is going to hear that and say, ooh, that's great. Everything is good in Apple now. It's time to buy, right? Well, you could see if you're buying Apple, you're buying at or near supply or retail prices. Remember, how we make money in the financial markets is not really different from how we make money buying and selling in other markets. We want to buy at demand or wholesale prices, sell at supply or retail prices. Make sense? Another word for demand, wholesale prices, right? We could say this Apple stock is down because of all these reasons over here, or we could say Apple is on sale. It's likely to, to turn higher here. I'm willing to risk this amount of money to potentially make that, okay? All right, let's let's keep going. Uh, well, you know, what? let me say one more thing. Um, again, people get so scared to buy when prices are down in the financial markets, right? And yet, not just avocados, but if you think of anything else that you like to buy in life, anytime that whatever it is is on sale or is cheaper, we all get excited to buy that and want to buy more. Yet people don't take that mentality to the financial markets. That's one of the biggest reasons professionals make so much money in the markets like banks and institutions, and most other people don't. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. So um, here's another one. So basically, if you look at the last two months of the financial markets, right? Here's a chart of the NASDAQ. We were going over the NASDAQ here. And if you don't understand what all the terms on the chart mean, uh, no worries. Don't, don't worry about it. So here we look at this opportunity in the NASDAQ, right? We had fair value up here, and there's specific criteria to identify fair value. And then we had our qualified demand zone all the way down here. The point is the distance between the qualified demand zone or wholesale prices was quite far from fair value. And remember, fair value is where the majority of buyers and sellers agree to buy and sell. Okay. So we started to get some bad news. The financial markets dropped. This is uh, last month in December, right? Right down to our qualified demand zone. Remember, competition to buy at demand causes prices to turn and push higher. Fair value, this right here is that, is the natural magnet that pulls price back up to it. Why? Because that's where the majority of buyers and sellers agree to buy and sell. The chart is already suggesting that over here. Okay. And again, a little bit later in the month, price comes down to the demand zone again. Competition to buy at demand pushes price higher. Fair value pulls it right back up to it. We also had an inverse bond market at supply at the same time at the same time that the uh, stock market was at demand. Right, we're very big on those inverse market relationships. 
But um, but my point is, you could look at this right here, this fair value, as four dollars for the avocado, and here is uh, the two dollar price down here. If these were avocados, people would love to buy them down here at two dollars and probably be bragging to all their avocado loving friends. But because it's the Nasdaq or a stock market, and because there's bad news associated with prices coming down, most people don't want to buy down here. They're only comfortable buying where everybody else is buying, right up here. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, same thing here on the, so we've been talking about demand and wholesale prices and how people, you know, in every other part of their life like to buy at wholesale prices. But in the financial world, people are scared to buy at wholesale prices. Uh, but how about uh, the middle of this week or actually two days ago? Here we had a supply zone develop in the S&P right up here. Okay. We're going over this with our members. And... Uh, and then in the middle of the week, prices gapped up, okay, right into the supply zone. I believe there was some good news or a lack of bad news. Prices gapped up right into the qualified supply zone, right, where banks, financial institutions were clearly selling. Competition to sell, uh, sell its supply, pushes price lower, and the new fair value in the S&P pulled price right back to it. Make sense? Uh, Mike, great question in the chat. Let me just address that real quick. So we, everything, we have a rule for everything. We don't have a lot of rules, but everything we do is rule-based. So um, when it comes to the second pullback or third pullback or for, fourth pullback, whatever, into a zone, um, we don't care, we don't necessarily care about how many times price comes back to the level because that doesn't help us really quantify you know, the, the supply demand imbalance there. What we care about is how deep price goes into the level. So we use the rule of 50%, meaning because price did not go 50% into the zone the first time, right? That, that evidence is suggesting that there's still a large enough supply demand imbalance here on the demand side to cause price to turn again. But now here that price went more than 50% into the zone, we would never take that again, right? And there are plenty of times where price will touch a zone two, three, four times, and that's fine. But once it goes too deep, remember, inside here, there are stacks of unfilled buy orders at every price. Every time price comes back to, into this area, more of those buy orders are being filled. The demand is being depleted or filled. Make sense? We use that rule of 50%. You can play with that number if you want to. If you want to, if you want to keep it higher probability, just bring that number down a little bit, right? Maybe make it 25% or something. Up to you. So, if 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 it's all really about supply, demand, and fair value, if that's really how all markets out there work in the financial market, in other parts of life, right? Buying houses, cars, food, appliances, clothes, clothing, you know, you name it. Um, if, if that's really how the financial markets work or, or how markets work, then how is it that still so many people lose money? And I'm really interested in your thoughts. So type away in the chat if you have thoughts on this. And I want to add something else to this. You know, when, when I when I learned this stuff and got exposed to it, that was back in the late 90s on the trading floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, right? And, and so, so that was over 20, that's a little over 20 years ago, right? Um, but think about it over the past 20 years, the development of the internet, anybody this, these days can go on the internet and type in, you know, show me profitable trading strategies or profitable trading strategies or how to make money trading. And you literally will get millions of answers, right? So if it's really all about supply, demand, fair value, and you can ask the internet anytime, uh, how to properly trade and you're going to get millions of answers. Why do so many people still lose money? Anybody have any thoughts on that? What do you think? Now, obviously, you know, we asked Google here, what are the most popular trading strategies, right? 
Um, that's one thing. What else? And it, at the end of the day, it really comes down to what buy and sell decisions people are making. And that's what I noticed on the trading floor early on. There were really two groups. Groups who made decisions based on what's real, banks and financial institutions, and, and the group that made decisions based on what they feel, right? Emotional buying and selling. Not buying Apple when it's down at demand or wholesale prices, but instead buying Apple uh, once they announce good earnings when price is at or near supply. You know, good good point in the chat there. Uh, lack of, of uh, like knowledge, I think, I think you're saying there. I've thought about that. Thought, you know, I, I used to think in the early days, trade after a price move. Yeah, that's that's a big one. I used to think years ago, you know, education is a solution. You need more education, more education. But then I realized education, it, at least on the internet, has not been the solution. It's kind of been more of the problem, right? Correct. Great. Yeah, that's another great point. Just so many variations of, of, uh, yeah, supply, demand, and all these other strategies. But you know what, uh, Junior? I'm going to call you Junior. If that's okay. Um, uh, good point there. But think about it. In 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 the world of buying and selling anything else out there, it's all about wholesale and retail, right? Buy it wholesale, sell it retail. Does you know do do companies or groups? You know, do they, does anyone ever play with variations of that? No, it's all about how can I buy at retail wholesale prices and sell at retail prices, right? There's not, it's not like there's 10 variations of that. It's who can do it better. Right. Yeah. It, yes. And when it comes to supply demand strategy, believe me, I'm well aware that uh, people, you know, Originally, there was one strategy. That's still the strategy that I use today that we use at the Pinnacle Institute, um, the real one, the original one. I'm actually going to go over that deep tomorrow in that session, but I'll give you more information on that later. Um, but I, I'm well aware that people have added so many different things to it, indicators, oscillators, and everything else. So let's dive into this, right? And, and again, nobody owns supply and demand and fair value. It's, it's like having a conversation about uh, like gravity, right? It's, it's there. It's what drives price in every market. Nobody owns that. Um, so what are some of the most popular trading strategies in the world? Let's run through these, right? In other words, what are the buy and sell decisions or what is driving the buy and sell decisions that is causing people to lose money? And I'll, I'll read back in the chat in a moment. Let's talk about some of the most popular trading strategies in the world. How about trend? Trend's probably the most popular, right? Think about it. The trend trader does not buy at demand. They let prices turn higher at demand. Then they wait for a series of higher highs and higher lows, and then they buy. They don't sell at supply. They let prices turn lower at supply, and then they wait for a series of lower highs and lower lows, and then they sell. What's the problem? They're buying and selling after the move is underway, and they're buying and selling inside fair value or the novice space, which is the last thing we want to do. Make sense? How about people like like Apple who you know listened to the their their good earnings report and bought today? Well, prices have been rallying for three days already. Now the good news comes out, price gaps up, it gets close to supply, and now everybody wants to buy it, right? Buying when the news is good and selling when the news is bad means you're typically buying at or near retail prices or supply and selling at or near wholesale prices or demand. Doesn't work. And by the way, I see we have uh, uh, you know some people here from uh, India. Welcome, right? From um, so India, people trade the Nifty and Nifty stocks, right? And one thing I can say is, um, you know, I've been to India a number of times. I'm very familiar with the Nifty and 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 stocks there and all that. And one thing that's a little unique 
it's not completely unique to India by any means. I mean, this is an issue that happens all over the world. We're human beings, right? We're, we're, all, we're not all wired that different. Um, but in India, what I've noticed, and correct me if I'm wrong, my, my, uh, my friends here from India, it, it seems like people spent, you know, focus so much on the news. And that's why you get, that's why you get so many of these big gaps. Yes, the Nifty, it's, again, it's all about supply and demand in the Nifty, just like it's all about supply and demand in any market. But, but it, it, in India, they, they focus so much on the news. And when the news is good, everybody buys, you get this big gap up, usually it's at or near supply. When the news is bad, everybody sells, you get this big gap down and, you know, and that, and price is usually at or near demand or wholesale prices, right? Yeah. There's just such this big focus on buying when the news is good and selling when the news is bad. And, um, and again, usually that brings price real quickly to our key supply and demand zones. Okay. Um, how about indicators and oscillators? A lot of people, again, very, very popular um, thing to use. And I'm talking about all of them. They're all different versions of the same thing. Moving averages, stochastics, MACD, RSI, you name it. And on and on and on. A lot of people use the moving average crossover as a buy signal, right? So here, price pulls back to a demand zone where we want to be a, a buyer, okay? And uh, however, if you use a moving average crossover as a buy signal, remember the moving average isn't even going to start turning higher until after price does. And the moving averages aren't going to cross until here, meaning you're buying all the way up here, which means you've pretty much doubled or tripled your risk, right? And of course, cut into your reward. Indicators and oscillators all lag price. They just do what price has already done. By adding any tool to your decision-making process that lags price, by definition, all you're doing is increasing risk and decreasing reward. Make sense? You know, and look, when it comes to trend or buying when the news is good or using indicators and oscillators, you know, why do people do that? Because they're they, they because they, you know they don't under obviously they don't understand the supply demand strategy enough, but but they're also afraid. They want confirmation. They want to see that price is moving higher already, right? They want confirmation of a price turn. Well, guess what? And I'm going to be very real with you. You can have confirmation, and you can have that that you know that the comfort of price moving higher, or you can have a low risk high reward, high probability entry, but you can't have both, okay? You can have that confirmation or you can have the low risk entry, but you can't have both. So you need to choose. Now, the, the flaw in all that is um, thinking that once you have that confirmation and you get in, that price is still going to move in your direction. The reality is it's less likely to. We'll get into that in a moment. There's another very popular strategy that that 90% of losing traders tends to focus on and it's and it's and it's right at the heart of technical analysis. I mean a lot of this is, but it's the chart patterns. Anybody have a favorite chart pattern out there? Double bottoms, double tops, head and shoulders, this and that. You can name them all, cup and handle, doesn't matter. They're all ver different versions of the same thing. Um, let's go over this one. Here's the double bottom, right? Now follow the technical analysis rules. You have two bottoms here, and then you're supposed to draw the neckline. And when price trades above the neckline, you're supposed to buy. What's the problem? Why isn't this group making money? You're buying after such a huge rally in price and selling after such a big drop in price. Very difficult to make money buying and selling anything when you do that. Okay, but here's the here's the big um, I think here's the big overall question that most people uh, don't. Yeah, that's another one, Mike. Yeah, there's there's a bunch, but that's another one. But here here's the overall question that that most people never seem to ask themselves, and it's 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 such a simple basic question. So forgive me if I sound too basic when I say it, but it's this: How do we make money? buying and selling in the financial markets, right? 
and I know it's basic, but think about it. When we buy, others have to buy after us at higher prices or there's no way to profit. When we sell, others have to sell after us at lower prices or there's no way to profit, right? So now think about this. Mean, well, meaning whatever strategy you're going to use to buy and sell in the markets, you better make sure that there are other strategies that have people buying after you buy and selling after you sell. Does that make sense? In other words, if you wait for the trend trader, you let prices turn higher at demand, then you wait for the higher highs and higher lows, and then you buy, who's going to buy from you? You wait for the, the double bottom, then you wait for prices to rally all the way up, and then you wait for them to break above the neckline, and then you buy, who's going to buy from you? Make sense? All right. Now, I know we've I've kind of spent a lot of time on this, way more time than I planned on. But but to me, this type of session that we're having here today is so important. We could talk about making money all day, but but focusing on losing money is so key because most people lose money. And, and if we get through this session and and even two or three people out of anyone who's going to watch this session and, you know, can stop losing money because of what we go over here, to me, that's a big win. We're all going to sleep great at night knowing that uh, we're doing everything we can to focus on that, right? All right, let's keep going. So the big drop in the financial markets this week, and, and you know, and um, um, for some of the markets, it's been, I think, one of the biggest drops ever, right? Um, and the month is not over until next week. But anyway, it's been a big drop. I want to point something out to you here. So for us, that drop came from a, started with a NASDAQ supply zone. Now, this is the all-time high in the queues right now. But notice where this supply zone is located. You see all of this trading here, okay? Um, location of your supply and demand zones. I know I'm switching gears here for a minute, but location of, of your supply demand zones is key. It's the most important thing. Um, just because you have a rally-based rally or a drop-based rally or or a drop-based drop and a rally-based drop, the majority of those are going to not work. What's key is we have to find the ones that have the largest supply-demand imbalance in them, okay? And for that, location is key. Now, notice this supply zone is above all of this, just like our demand zones are going to be below all of this, right? Price goes up and uh, trades up into our supply zone up here, which is above this range. First of all, let me explain something. The reason why for all of these days here that price can't trade higher into the zone, what's the reason? It's because there's too, too large of a supply demand imbalance up here. So much so that you don't even get any trading, okay? So eventually, price does rally up to supply, competition to sell up here. Uh, causes prices to turn and pushes it lower through this range, then through this range, right? And then now we're just reaching some uh, kind of the first set of demand zones, you know, uh, once or twice this week, All right? Now watch this one. Here's the Nikkei. So this is the low in the Nikkei this week. It's rallied about 800 points off of our qualified demand zone, but take a look. Notice, see all this trading over here when we were setting this uh, opportunity up? This is the entire, there's 2021, there's January. This is the entire last year's trading in the Nikkei. Notice the range. Notice our qualified demand zone is below the range. Here's a little rally base rally. And that's so far the low in the week. Uh, I guess it's Friday. That's the low in the week of the week in the Nikkei. It's also traded below all of last year's low to get there. And it quickly rallied about 800 points, right? Okay. Um, but think about it. Just like this rally base rally worked, I could show you tons inside here that don't work. Okay. The supplier demand zones that have the largest imbalance, location of those supply demand zones is what's key. We want to stay out of fair value, out of the middle. 
And that's the whole point here. Most strategies that people use have you buying and selling right in the middle. Does that make sense? What we do is focus, have this razor sharp focus on how you make money buying and selling anything in life, right? Wholesale prices, retail prices, demand, supply. Again, we're looking at a chart of the Nikkei here. Why can't this be a chart of avocados? We'd be having the same conversations. Here's the $2 down here. Here's four and here's six. And like I said earlier, much of this has to do with focusing on what's real and not what you feel. Make sense? All right. Hey, it was great to be with you. Great to see uh, many of you again. And uh, hopefully that was helpful.